Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Uh, my name is Dawn Russell, and I'm going to be presenting on UX, UI, and the food that we eat, mentoring women in computer science. So to lay a foundation, um, and I do this because over the last year at Mount Holyoke College, I've had a number of staff members approach me and say, after the meeting, what is UX? What is UI? And I thought, let's get started with that, and then we'll build the rest of the story on top of that. So user experience, or UX, is a conglomeration of tasks that we can perform to basically evaluate the, perform the overall optimization and effectiveness and enjoyableness of a product. So was that pleasurable? Did it meet my goal? How quickly could I get it done? Right? So we want to look at these kinds of goals when we're, using, when we're applying user experience methodologies. User interface is a complement, or UI, to UX in that it's the presentation of a product. It is the look and feel and the interactivity of that product. So Emil Lamprecht summarized it nicely with a metaphor about the body in which he says, the skeleton of the body is like the code, it's the structure in a digital product. UX would be like the organs that make up the body. So let's say we had too much to drink tonight, or, and our kidney gets a little too much toxin, and it's sending out these signals to the rest of the organs saying, hey, you went a little too far last night, and the next day, you get the results of that. It affects the overall performance of your life and how you support life in your body. So with user experience, you know, there's this input and output system where we're trying to analyze and, and maintain you know, health of both the product and our body, and so the organs help balance that out, and user experience is, is a metaphor to that. And then UI would be how we present ourselves to the world, how we sense things, the way that we react. So over the next few slides, I'm going to tell you three stories that overlap each other. Um, essentially, I worked on a project where we redesigned and built a menu system for Mount Holyoke College. And at that core, I'm going to demonstrate the development cycle that includes user experience methodologies throughout every decision-making process. I also want to share with you an inspired exchange between myself and the computer science students with which I mentored. So you'll see these stories woven through as we proceed. So just to, to sort of step back a minute, we're dealing with menus and nutrition. At Mount Holyoke College, all of the students live on campus, and that means that they eat all three meals, if not more, um, on campus. <laughs> Um, so I thought I'd just touch base real quick with nutrition because it sort of found the entire um, social context for, for doing the research and thought processes. So NYU uh, published uh, a study that, uh, in, it's called Live Well NYU, and in it they're looking at nutrition and college students specifically. Now we all know, we've known since we were this tall, that good nutrition is going to support life performance, it's going to make us um, focus and concentrate, it's going to maintain a healthy weight when paired with exercise. Um, it's, it's really a foundation to you know, being successful in life. And despite that, um, we have students who engage in poor dietary habits, and they eat erratically. Um, so even though they know that it's going to promote a healthy immune system and help them cope with stress and do better in school, which is why they're there, they still don't take part in, in eating well. And this is influenced by a variety of factors. So how much time do they have? What are their friends eating and when do they eat? And what do they know about nutrition and access to the foods that they can eat? And I'd like to add to this slide um, allergies and dietary restrictions. This is becoming much, and more, much more prevalent in how we relay information about food. So let's do a quick little poll. 
How many people in this room have allergies or dietary restrictions? So I'd say we're about 40%. And how many people have ever skipped a meal because they could not find something quickly online local to where they were, so they just had to let it go? All right, about 30 to 40% there. And then how many people have ever experienced a menu online that's a PDF and you're on your phone and you're trying to scroll in Zoom? All right, we've all experienced that. Okay, great. <laughs> so when you start to think about this, um, you start to get a sense of what I'm grappling with um, as far as this project goes. So mentorship, why do I call it mentorship? So I was actually the team lead for this project of a group of computer science students that are all women. Mount Holyoke College is a, is a women's college in Western Massachusetts. Um, the reason I took the mentorship approach is because I am an innately curious person. I want to learn from these brilliant women as much as I want to share what I know with them because that's an environment where I'm going to grow the most. So I set it up as an advisee role in the hopes that they would start to come with me. I mean, when they first got you know, hired as part of our team, um, they were very, very shy, and it was very difficult. Like, you'd walk in the room and look down at their computer, and you know, it, was, it was a very, um, very tense environment, and one in which I really needed to sort of encourage contributions. And so I felt that rather than be didactic and say, this is what you need to do, A, B, C, D, I'd say, well, what do you think? What are you interested in working on? So as part of the mentorship, there are three factors that played into that. Before we take on any project, we want to think about why we're doing that. I mean, there's obviously a business need, and there's a user need, but why do you want to work on it, right? Why do you want to take your time and invest your energy in this, especially if there are numerous projects you could choose? So developing a vision is really important. Once we had that vision determined and we had focused in on something, then it was about collaboration. And so I would set up the environment where maybe I would contribute the first or second idea, and then I would be quiet and, and look around and say, well, what do you think? You know, give me your idea, share with me. And out of that grew confidence. I started to see these women blossom and bloom, and it was really humbling. I covered the thing, it was like, what? All right, so the second piece of the story, so there's the first piece is the mentorship, and then the UX design process and how that, that actually factors in. So I've broken this up into the four eyes. There's influence, and this is the whole part of the process where you're sharing your vision for a product overhaul with stakeholders that may or may not be in your division. Right? We, we work in a campus environment, there's like 800 employees, we have faculty and staff, and we have dining services, and we have admissions and advancement. So there's all of these diverse um, offices across campus, and so influence is really important, being able to talk their language, gathering the requirements, and then shaping the direction of the project, taking into account the, person, the user's needs. The second I would be insight. So this is really the heart of the user experience design process. So again, this is a process and all of these things factor into it. So influence, you can't just go and do a bunch of research and do a bunch of design and not think about your stakeholders if you want to be successful implementing and practicing user experience in your work. So insight is the heart where you're going to be doing things like persona development, metrics analysis, moderated and unmoderated testing, card sorting, empathy maps. All of this is giving you insight into how you're actually going to move forward and make this a better product or create a product from scratch. The third eye is the interface. This is where the UI piece comes in, and it's the interactivity. It's going to be how we design things so that they're meaningful, so that there's a good information architecture, so that we understand that this button will do this, or this navigation will act this way. And then finally, there's the implementation. 
This is where we actually look at the business, I'm sorry, excuse me, not the business requirements, but we look at the limitations of the build, and we bring together the code, and we look at the proprietary software and figure out how we can pull it apart or not, or the open source software, depending on what you're working with. So as you can see, all of these things play into each other. So before we go into the details of the project, I want to get back to vision and what brought me to this place. So in 2016, I was approached by Tasha Tudor and family uh, to work on a redesign and build of a numerous suite of products that they had. It was the biggest project that I had ever worked on. And at the time, I owned my own company and had a team of people working with me. And it was almost six or seven months that we invested the entire team's focus on this. Now, for those of you who don't know, or maybe if I remind you, Tasha Tudor illustrated things like The Secret Garden. So she's internationally renowned for her um, illustrations and her writing. And she was also very authentic in her lifestyle. So it was an inspiring project to be a part of. So after I delved into this, I was given the opportunity to go deeper and wider with information architecture, content strategy, design, managing a team, card sorting, thinking about how we were going to bring together three disparate websites. One was e-commerce, one was a blog, one was Share My Pet, because she had two corgis. And uh, everybody that's a lover of Tasha Tudor has a pet that they want to talk about. Um, so you can take a look at that. It's a really fun little interface. Um, so we launched the project in September of 2016. And I was back to business as usual, doing small to mid-sized mid websites and redesigns that left me feeling a little stale. So this is my, my office here in, in uh, Brattleboro, Vermont. Um, it was on a main street. It had upstairs and downstairs. Um, and you would think from the outside that, hey, you know, she's successful. She's got a great business. She's got over 100 clients. You know, things are going great. But Inside, I was like, I want to do more. I want to go enterprise. I want to do these projects that take a year with a team of people that are just as smart as me. I don't want to have all the answers all the time. So why Mount Holyoke College, right? Well, first of all, I received an email in November of 2016, just a couple of months after I launched the project. And it was from a web standards group that I was part of, and it said, if you want to work for two of my favorite people on enterprise-level projects doing all sorts of things, take a look at this job. And it just came in. I wasn't actually looking. Um, so I started to do a little research on Mount Holyoke College, and I was really inspired by the types of people that had gone to school there and the types of things they were doing in the world. So if we go way back into the 1800s, in 1848, Emily Dickinson, an American poet, graduated from Mount Holyoke College. 1902, Frances Perkins, the first woman presidential cabinet member. And then in 1991, Heather Hardy, who some of you may be familiar with. She's the general manager of AOL, and prior to that, um, she was the senior editor for TechCrunch, which was acquired by AOL. So you can see there's, there's a whole suite of women that come out of this incredibly forward-thinking and powerful in their own way. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the interview process. LITS is the Library and Information Technology Services, so that's a merged library and technology division. There's about 30 or so in the United States um, that have done this because learning and research is so acutely tied to technology and teaching. If you want to apply at Mount Holyoke, make sure that you bring a day's rations. Um, it was unbelievable. So I did an online interview, and then I was called to campus. There were seven interviews with a lunch break, one of which had 27 people all asking me how I would solve the world's problems when it comes to technology. Specifically, library search, which is un, I don't know if any of you have done any, uh, you know, trying to download an e-journal or an e-book, but it's like 11 interfaces and 10 clicks. So, but I got through it and I was offered the position. 
Um, as far as my business goes, I had just, I was offered the position uh, last year in early spring. Um, I was actually on my way to a Joomla. Um, it was actually a brainstorming session. I, I worked very closely with Joomla, which is an open source content management system. It's the second most used in the world. Um, and I was involved in their UX team leadership. I was a co-leader co of that team. Uh, so I had just gotten back from, from London, and I had talked to a lot of people about this position. I found a sister company to my own, and then I sold the company, made sure that all my clients were transitioned, and then this is my first day coming up over the bank. Um, so you can see I'm primed and I'm ready, and I'm really excited about working on enterprise-level software. I'm going to get to work with a bunch of people that are technologically inclined and know things just as well as I do, but in other areas, so we can complement each other. So I'm, I'm feeling really positive. Day one, I'm given this assignment where I need to catalog all of the service points that we currently host or use within Mount Holyoke College's alumni, faculty, staff, and students. So this is internal facing. So this is a diagram that I was given by Matthew Strand, who is the head of administrative computing. And you can see here, oops, ooh, that's not the laser pointer. Well, anyways, here we have, this is cloud-based, this is hosted on campus, this is what feeds into what. So I was given the job of analyzing this and determining what do we need to work on next. So here I began cataloging everything. What is a description of it? When do people use it? When was the last time it was updated? What department owns it? And it goes on and on. I think that it goes to like AH or something. I mean, it just goes all the way across. And from that, I needed to work with the students to say, OK, what are all of these things? How often do you use them? This is an example of one of them the one we're going to be talking about today. It's called Mount Holyoke College Dining Services, This Week's Menu. And um, as you can tell, it was built in the 90s, I would say. <laughs> I don't know if many of you know what this is, but I can guarantee you that no 20-year-old female college student knows what a Blackberry is. <laughs> What's that? Old school yeah, exactly, yes. Nice job. <laughs> A for effort, yes. Um, so, so this is an example of one of the 133 that we came across. Now, to give them credit, they weren't all as bad as this. This is how they would find a job on campus. So you can see here we have the mobile phone. It's not looking so good. <laughs> right? We have typography issues. We have search issues. Things that are bright red are sometimes links, sometimes not links. So we needed to refine our project um, selection down to the top 10. And um, as you can see here, this is a slide from, from the presentation that we gave to the director of technology. Um, we had three months, a core team of three staff and three full-time student programmers to accomplish the goal of redesigning one of these top 10 things. So what we decided to do was to think about what students would use the most in the fall. Um, that seemed to make the most sense. And then analyze the projects based on Google Analytics, uh, how many people were using them per day, uh, and, and look at uh, what was causing the, the students in my team the most frustration, and then reaching out to see if that was consistent with other students around campus. This was a, a wonderful um, example of us sort of brainstorming and looking through this list of 133, narrowing it down, and then saying, what do you think? Where should we put our efforts? We noted like how many hours we thought it would take, what our initial recommendations would be, and then we presented it to the director of technology. And of course, he, he recommended that we move forward with, with this one, which is no big surprise. Um, so the reason that we chose this one in particular was that it had 2,200 students using it three times a day. So it's almost 10,000 uses a day. It was circa mid-1990s, a table-based product. The mobile site existed, but it was clunky. Um, it didn't serve an international body, student body very well. Now, Mount Holyoke has 34% students 
that are from around the world. We represent 61 countries. So there's 195 countries, so it's, it's pretty diverse as far as um, languages and uh, understanding of food and different types of dietary requirements. And then, of course, the student programmers shared a collective enthusiasm to fix the service point. And there was one other big factor. This just opened in January of this year. It's a $55 million facility where dining services was going to move all of their locations into one huge dining center. Of course, everyone's eyes were focused on this and no one was thinking about the website. You can see, this is a map of our campus. We actually built this. Um, it's a really awesome Google integrated um, map. These are all of the different locations that existed and then this is the new building that they put in place here. So the president, you know, wrote this piece, which is, I think, it's, it's moving. She's thinking about it as a space of exchange, of cultural dialogue, where casual can meet programmatic, where they can have student organizations coming together, and of course, food. And we have nine dining stations that are international. Um, we have sushi, we have halal, we have comfort foods, we have a brew pub, which is coffee in the morning and beer at night. So, in order to pitch the next phase of this, which would mean I need to talk to dining services and say, hey, would you like us to redo your website for you? I needed to get a little more information, and this is where the user experience piece really starts to take off, the insight piece. So, in 1995, Jacob Nielsen, who is sort of one of the original coiners of, of the term UX, wrote this piece and published it on, the, on his website, the Nielsen Norman website. And it breaks down um, heuristic analysis into 10 key points, out of which we wanted to narrow it down and sort of pull out how, are the, how is this site working, how does it compare to other sites, and, and where are there areas for improvement. So this is an internal shot of that site. Um, you can see here that uh, aesthetic and minimalist design, one of the ten heuristic principles, is certainly struggling um, here with the breakfast, lunch, and dinner being presented all on one page. Um, and then, of course, all the different colors and what they mean, and then there's some icons, but they're really low-quality GIFs. Um, so that was one of the areas. Flexibility and efficiency of use. So think about college students, right? They need to get their food, they need to get it quickly, especially at Mount Holyoke College because literally every single student eats between 12 and 1.30, right? So if they have to go to this website and scroll and zoom and like figure out what is being served for lunch that they can actually eat, there's a high chance that they're not going to eat. Recognition rather than recall. Now one of the biggest issues with this site was the ability to compare options. So you had to go to the home page and then click through to a particular location or station, decide what you wanted to eat, and then go back to the home page to click on another station. And if you wanted to add a date to that, like what about tomorrow, what are they serving? It even became more complicated. You couldn't just choose a date, choose a location, and then go between them quickly. So that re required a lot of recall rather than just quick access. And then finally, consistency and standards. So you saw here, this is, this is one view, this is the mobile view, and then the other one had it, and you see these little asterisks. So one asterisk meant vegetarian, two asterisk meant vegan. Um, and there was no color here, but there was color on the other one. It was just a mess. So as part of determining um, the status of things, we also needed to think about the project ecosystem. This is where the project lives. So what roles and skills did we have available to us within our team? What can I do? What can Megan do? What can Darian do? What, what do we bring to the table? What is the college culture? How would they feel about me coming to them and saying, by the way, <laughs> while you have this $55 million project going on, you might want to think about your website, right? It could be very insulting. Um, fortunately, uh, Mount Holyoke is really focused on diverse, inclusive, accepting, welcoming, safe space for everyone. 
Um, in fact, just two weeks ago, uh, I did a diversity inclusion training. That was a full day. We have 100% participation. That means every CIO, VP, trustee, staff, faculty, all have to participate in this training. So we have a great college culture. Context. So what type of site is it? And what is its purpose? In this case, it's a um, content site. So it's data-driven. The pages are pretty much similar on every, you know, the interface should be fairly similar. What changes is the, the information that you're getting on a daily basis. So that has certain things that come along with it in terms of um, what we need to, to strive for. And the possibilities, right? It's proprietary software. So keep in mind, I had no access to the web preferences portal. That was where you set all of the configurations because it, I could go in and actually blow up the entire functioning software for how they order food and inventory food and make recipes and stuff. And so I was given screenshots of the configuration pages. And I had to determine from that what I could and could not do. Plus, I had to examine the code base and determine, is it minified? Is it not? What can I do? How can I pull it apart? So all of this was taken into consideration when I decided um, what the project ecosystem is, to be able to determine what can I propose, right? How can I influence them to go in this direction? I don't want to just shoot off the cuff and be like, well, we could do this, we could do that. It doesn't work that way. So here is our meeting with Dining Services. This is our second stakeholder meeting, the first one being with the Director of Technology. And so in this, we, we lay out the goal. We talk about the obstacles, right? All of the research that we've done to this point, we put into this presentation and we, and we paint a picture for them of what it could be like. And we include it in this examples, real examples, of schools like Harvard and UCLA who had already taken the same product, the same software, and redone the interface. We got the green light! Yay! <laughs> so, um, big surprise there. Uh, so, the next step uh, was to start to really dig deeper into what the user's needs are. Um, so, as I've already expressed, um, our students are in, they're global leaders in the world, and, or become global leaders, uh, and we wanted to start to assess um, you know, what are the specific needs of each person? What are their roles? What, what do they, are they introverts? Are they extroverts? Do they have allergies? Do they have dietary restrictions? So this is actually um, captured from We Are Mount Holyoke, which is a current campaign that's running right now, and it's really beautiful. There's all these portraits of all these amazing women who are attending the school right now and doing really incredible things. So I encourage you to take a look at that website. So our users turned out to be between 18 and 26 years old, which means they're young and they most likely will have some sort of mobile device. They're female. Hello. Okay. I'll project. Hello? All right, great, thank you. So they're female or identify as female. So what does that tell us about the user? Potentially that they're more interested in nutrition, that they're focusing on their caloric intake. Um, they live and eat on campus. So again, as I expressed earlier, the timeline of everyone coming together between an hour and a half section, 2,200 people, means that there's a lot of competition for a particular type of food, uh, and they need to quickly be able to ascertain what's available in, you know, in their dietary needs uh, to be able to find, find the food that they're looking for and get to class. They're globally diverse. So for this, I kept coming back to this idea of students who may not have learned English as their first language. And so how could I make this food easier to understand more quickly, visually, right? So that's when I started to think about iconography. 
50% of our students have an allergy or dietary restriction. In this room, we're at 40%. Um, I'm not sure, you know, how that, how that ranks overall globally. But the fact that that's a, a concern really means we need to surface it in a consistent way that's visually recognizable and include filters for it. And 65% use their phone to access the menu on a daily basis. So I'm going to show you this video. This is Jenny Lin. She's one of uh, a, an ideal student from, from Mount Holyoke. Let's see. Let me get this going. Mount Holyoke is really into being involved, being proactive and hands-on. The first thing that led me to realize this was getting a package in the mail and having it be our common read. And our common read for when I was a freshman was Half the Sky. And I was so surprised that a school, my school, had sent me a book, a manual, to change the world. It, it was a manual to teach us how to take the little steps for those big changes. When I got here, I met all these amazing women who not only had this passion to change the world, they were doing things in the summer, during the school year, after tennis practice, after soccer practice, after rehearsal, to bring about change and the change that they wanted to see. In high school, every summer, I returned to China to teach in the countryside um, or volunteer in orphanages. And I loved doing that, but I felt alone a lot of the times. I felt like I was the only one who really cared. I would hear my classmates talk about how they wanted to change the world or how they wanted to be proactive, but I never saw that jump from imagination to reality until I got here. And it's been such a gift and an honor to be a part of a community like this. So who doesn't want to see Jenny, right? <laughs> She's amazing, and they all are. It's, 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 really, it's really incredible. Um, so one of the things I want to say about personas before I jump into uh, looking at metrics is that just as in this video, personas are an opportunity by which you can get your stakeholders to identify with the user because you give them a face, you give them a name, you give them an age, you say to them, this is what this person's personality is like. This is what they do on a daily basis, and this is how we can meet their needs with the product that, that we're thinking about designing or building. So I, I think there's a lot of people that are on the, on the fence about personas, but um, being empathic and, and loving to know the stories of people, um, I, think, I think they're really effective in the process. So another aspect that we jumped into was looking at the metrics. So what can we tell from this? We have the session duration. I'm just going to quickly go over this. Time on page, 1 minute and 51 seconds, right? That's a long time. You know, we average, what, 8, 10 seconds if you're lucky? Um, so that means they're spending a lot of time, you know, zooming, and it, it validated that assumption, right? Um, we have 56,000 sessions, of which there are 102,000 page views. Now, this was, a, this was before we started. It was February, March, when I knew everyone was there, before spring break. That means they're only looking at 1.8 pages. That means they've gone home and to one page and made a decision. So I don't think we're being very effective at our work if they're only looking at one option of the nine. And the bounce rate is 67%. You want to average around 20, 25% on your bounce rate. Uh, depending on the site, but in most cases, you want people to actually exit on a different page than what they enter on. Um, so that, that was troubling, troubling figures. So you want to take in the user perspective. You want to look at the analytics, which reflect the user's search patterns and navigation patterns. And then you want to blend that with the business requirements. Otherwise, you're never going to get support from the business because that's who you work for, right? So we met with them and, and said, what is it that we need to target based on your perspective? If something was really out of, of range, of scope, um, I, would, I would work with them, massage them to, to reel it in a little bit. Because sometimes people don't understand when they're the head of dining services, what's involved in, a, in the redesign and build of a, of a digital product. They get all these ideas and you're like, okay, rein it in a little bit. Um, let's really stay focused on what's important here. So one of the things they, they said was, 
essential was that we needed to keep all the functionality. Well, what functionality? Okay, here's a picture of the screenshot of web preferences. Here's all the things that are included for functionality, including page count at the bottom as a ticker. They had to have it, so I had to design for it, right? They weren't willing to compromise anything when it came to that. It needs to launch in three months, so we needed to get it out for September 1st. We needed to be able to design it to move from location to station because while we were launching it September 1st, the center wasn't going to be ready and open until January of this year. And so I needed to design it for that, which was impossible because they couldn't create a test environment because of inventory. So I literally had to be there like New Year's Day on to make sure that everything looked good when that transition happened. Because it was a switch they couldn't turn on prior to. So that was, that was definitely a stressful piece of the project. And of course, it needed to be mobile friendly without having to have the separate app. And the real caveat, we had to maintain it after. Once I owned that project, once I took it on, we had to maintain it. So we still go in and update different things on a regular basis. They email me once or twice a week and say, hey, we've got this new idea, this new thing, blah, blah, blah. So I am now eternally responsible. <laughs> So we've got personas, we've got metrics analysis, we've got the business requirements, and now we have interaction design, right? This is the piece, the UI piece. So hours, hours could only be found if you clicked into the location from the homepage, and it was a small little thing in some obscure color up in the upper right-hand corner. So is it open right now? I have no idea, and it's gonna be a lot of effort to figure that out. So we wanted to surface the hours in more locations and bring them to the home page so you could quickly look at all of the, the different stations and, and see what's open right now. I wanted to create iconography because we had an international student basis. I wanted to create visuals that maybe the first time they saw it, the goal is that they could understand it immediately, but at least the second or third time they knew once they clicked on it or interacted with it, this represents shellfish, this represents vegetarian, this represents gluten. Compare options. We talked about this earlier. I'm on a page, my parents are coming on Saturday, I want to bring them to a nice meal, what's going to be served? Okay, click Saturday, go through, boom, 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 analyze dinner for each one, and then you know where you're going to bring your parents. I wanted to reduce the cognitive load, right? This is the amount of energy it takes to actually understand what it is that you're looking at on the page. I mean, that first example with all three columns and all the different colors, that is causing the brain to work way too hard, especially when it's hungry, <laughs> to figure out what it's going to eat, right? I wanted to design it like an app. And I, d I de decided that approach simply because the students are young, they're most likely going to be looking at it, 65% of them, on their phone. I wanted it to feel like a native environment for them so that they could quickly move around inside of it. And then this was supposed to I change the order and then the animation didn't follow. Um, so surface a legend in case they didn't know what the visual meant. So here is the iconography for the allergens and the dietary restrictions. Um, so I chose color. We have a nice brand guideline from communications so that you could be like, oh, orange, that's the one I want to avoid. Um, or I'm looking for the burgundy, I want vegan. One thing I want to say about the dietary requirements and the allergens, so this was a limitation of the build, and I'll get into that a little bit more here, but dietary requirements are socially constructed describers. So vegan and vegetarian, there's something that you cannot determine that necessarily, unless you had AI in the product, um, you can't determine it from just reading the ingredients. Whereas allergens, the program was configured to be able to say, oh, it has wheat flour, then it means that it has gluten in it. So as a result, the only feature that showed iconography in this program was 
the dietary requirements. Allergens were just shown deep, deep, deep down. When you clicked 16 clicks, you'd find the ingredients, and underneath that it said allergens, colon, and then listed each allergen. So I want to set that up for context. So as of when we took this project on, the only thing you could see was dietary requirements. And we have about 15,000 recipes. So for a staff member to go in, read the whole list, and be like, this has soy, this has coconut, this has gluten, would be an am amazing amount of, faculty, of staff time, and, and it, it was insurmountable. So we needed to come up with a way to code iconography to show up for allergens. That was something that, that I surfaced as part of this work. So now we're assimilating all these things that I've just discussed into a prototype. Now, why do we prototype? We want a prototype to avoid putting our developers through hundreds of hours of work to come up with something that fails, right? Um, so, so we put together all of these things, and we also prototype to get stakeholder buy-in. We can show them what they're going to expect, right? So this is done with Envision. I started in... Um, Illustrator and Photoshop, built up the prototypes, showed the different functionality. I did it for mobile as well as for the desktop. And this gives you a sense of, of some of our thoughts, breaking it out so the cognitive load is not so high. We have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, you know, easy to see hours. So we meet with dining services. This time we have the whole dining services team. We have the director. We have the person that maintains the software. We have the co-directors. And we show them our prototypes, and they give us the green flag. So now we're ready to actually implement and bring our ideas to fruition. So you can see how much work the user experience process takes, but in doing that, you can avoid all of these pitfalls and actually be really efficient in your implementation process, right? So we spent a month doing user experience work, and that took our coding time of let's code this and try this and do this and do that. We didn't have to guess. It was much more refined and focused. So the build limitations, I, I dove into this a little deeper once we got the green flag. I needed to understand the software. Uh, so I reached out to Chris Wibble. Um, one of the great things about uh, higher ed is that you can actually talk to people and say, hey, I see you did this redesign. Can you tell me all about it? And they actually tell you all the details and send you code samples. And um, so that's one of the benefits is I, I, he was very forthcoming and supportive in this process. I also talked with the developers at FoodPro, which is the software that fuels the menu system. Um, and they gave me a lot of understanding and the green flag to move forward to rewrite their code. What is the technical knowledge that we have? Nobody on our team wrote ASPX, right? It's a Microsoft sort of based language. Um, Visual, basic, and all of this stuff. I'm an open source girl, PHP, JavaScript, um, you know, things that, that I can work with and see the code on. But um, this, this posed a real problem, is what does this piece of AXP do? So it took a little time to, to pull that apart. Uh, I've already mentioned that piece, that we didn't have any ex access to their CMS. We only had the screenshots. And then, of course, we had to keep all the functionality. Now, this poses a little bit of a problem because most students leave campus during the summer, and this is when we were doing the project. We started in May. Um, and so suddenly, this really robust site turned into like one location open when they had the gymnastics conference, for example. So we were sitting here trying to design for all these things, but the, we didn't have a proper development instance um, where we could actually go in and stage all of these things. So that, that, that was a real limitation, I think, as we move forward. And then, of course, server setup. It's a Microsoft setup. The way that we did it, I was able to take ownership of my piece, which is the front end piece, but we had to leave the database and everything on an old 2012, 2013 Microsoft server. Um, so I got a brand new one spun up for the web piece, but it still has to communicate with this other server, which, which means that there's all of these connections and, and things that can reset or turn off or crash. Um, so that was, that was a complication. And then time. We only had two months at this point. So one of the things that uh, we really wanted to do when we started to dive into the code was to, to move into modular design. So modular design um, has been championed by two main people, Ethan Marcote and Brad Frost. Um, you may have heard of atomic design. 
And these, these two people are really focused on saying, okay, what snippets or modules or pieces or chunks are repeated? And then how can we build a page with all of these little blocks to simplify and make our code more efficient? And probably for those of you who code, this is like really basic. Um, but it's a very powerful concept. And it allows you to say, hey, I'm going to cherry pick this and cherry pick that and cherry pick this for the page. So a thing like a header or a footer or a sidebar, those are really basic types. But you can even get into like what makes up the intro to a blog. Okay, I want to have these four things, and I'm going to make that a little pattern. I'm going to make that a, a molecule within my page. So here we have the post-code build and the original code. And I, I just want to give a shout out to Megan. She was the lead student programmer for this project, and she is truly amazing and inspiring. Um, she's originally from Massachusetts, and when she joined our team in March of 2017, she had written very little HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, and no SAS. She had done no work in GitHub or Git. By the time we launched, she was like a master of these things. I mean, she just applied herself, dug into it, and helped us pull apart all of these things. So Amazon and Google, watch out. Montreal tech companies, this is your girl here. <laughs> What's that? No. Um, so I just wanted to show this little code sample, just so you can see the, the past here. We have all of the tables, and then some includes that pull things in. And then on this side, you can start to see where we have um, our little modules of content coming in for the module design. So these are some of the skill sets that the students learned. So our computer science program at Mount Holyoke is really focused on software development and doesn't include any user experience training or front-end development. So this was all new for these students. So we build it, just like that. And the code is ready to go. And the next step is to test our assumptions because while we had done all of the prep work, we really needed to see if they were accurate. So what we did is we created a survey to 50 students, filled it out, and we asked them you know, what year they were, um, what, whether or not they were an international student or not, um, if they had any dietary restrictions, have they ever used the website, and if so, on what devices. So we got a, a sample of, of a variety of different students, and then we narrowed it down to 12. And we conducted three moderated testing sessions, where the first one was just one student, just to say, okay, what do you think? And this was a, a senior, so she had used the site for three years um, in much pain and distress. And she went through the, the different um, tasks. We created seven tasks around the major goals that we were trying to achieve, and basically gave us a lot of feedback. And we were like, oh, we got to fix this. So we scheduled them a week apart and said, OK, these are all issues we didn't see. They're small. Let's fix them. And then we had the remaining 11 students come over two days a week apart. So we kept following this trajectory where we get feedback, make some changes, and then test it again until we got to a point where we felt really confident in our product. So the key performance indicators that we tested for, I'm just going to show these real quickly here. So we have the iconography. Do they understand these visuals? Do they know what it means? And if they don't, can they figure it out quickly? Um, can they figure out whether or not it has too much salt or what the calories are? Can they search, refine, and filter? So I don't want to see anything that has beef in it. I'm Hindu, and I, I only want ingredients that, that don't include that food because of my religious beliefs. Can they understand the navigation? Can they get from location to location, station to station, date to date, and move around without having issues or confusion? Can they do it on all the devices? So we tested tablet, phone, and desktop. Can they find the physical data and make sense of it? So, you know, what are the ingredients in this particular food? 
And then we added some branding for the campus because we're playing around with this idea of having all of the internal things branded with you know, things that are Mount Holyoke, and then giving them links to get them to things they use all the time, like Moodle, which is where they do their classwork, and the portal, which is where they, they post their hours or uh, court, register for course. So we played around with that, and we wanted to see if that was intuitive. We found it was more so with the new students, but the, the older students, why would I do that? I have it, I have it bookmarked. Um, so we did launch the last week of August. We got feedback like, I really like it, it's very convenient. Being gluten-free, it's really great to see what's there before I go. And this is very close to the prototype. There were some modifications that we made, but this, this is actually the live site uh, as of a week ago. Um, so we went live and everything was just beautiful. It was paradise, right? Now keep in mind, we were, we were doing all of this work during the summer when there were no students on campus, and we couldn't account for certain things. So let's talk about failure. In 1963, Mary Kay retired um, and started to write a book about what it meant to be a successful woman, business leader, salesperson. And at the conclusion of writing that text, she realized she had come up with a business model that could be really successful for women around the world. She wrote, for every failure, there's an alternative course of action. You just have to find it. When you come to a roadblock, take a detour. So for those of you who may be familiar with her or not, she founded Mary Kay Cosmetics, which is probably one of the most successful cosmetic companies in the world with her two sons, and that represents their first year in business. So I think this is good advice. Um, one of the speakers earlier was talking about failure and the importance of it, and I think if you are dedicated to your work and you push the boundaries of what's possible, you're going to have stumbling blocks, but the key is to be able to pick yourself up and then find another way to approach it. And maybe it will impact the rest, the rest of this you know, social culture that you're in or even the world in a positive way. So this is what happened. 20 hours of downtime, the first week, usually during lunch. <laughs> ah! <laughs> what in the world was going on, right? Is it the server, that it's a separate server? Is it um, the fact that there's not enough licenses? Did we not buy enough licenses from the vendor and now more people are using it because it's easier to use? Like, scrambling to try to figure out what's happening. Well, it turns out that my great idea of surfacing allergens was actually the root of the problem. We have 5,000 to 15,000 recipes, three to four allergens per meal on average, and 15 to 20,000 hits on the database by one user if they go through all the pages. We had surfaced these using JavaScript because that was the only method that we had at our disposal because no one wrote ASPX. And the JavaScript was just going through, reading the allergens in the details and saying, oh, that matches this icon, let's surface it next to this recipe. Right, so you're getting the gist of this. I'm gonna go back, actually. So, Essentially, what I did is I got on a call with the Food Pro developers team, and I said, listen, guys, it was all men. <laughs> this is what I found in my research. 50% of our students have an allergen. We need to figure out a way to show this. Is there any way you would be willing to rewrite your software to include this as a core feature? And I gave them all the data. And they said, sure, no problem. That would be great. And they integrated it in, and now UCLA, Harvard, all of the other colleges and universities have this feature, and they can put the allergens right in there as a picture, and it shows it. And guess what? Our, our site worked. <laughs> so it, it ended up being a really positive thing, but it was very stressful. And I, of course, felt awful um, for a couple weeks there. But, you know, I feel a lot better about it now. So, just a quick uh, summary of how things turned out. So this is one year after the first slide that I showed you. 
So now we have a 73% decrease in the time on the page. That's actually a good thing for us, right? Because we want it to be efficient. 30 seconds, that's enough time for them to get in, find what they need, filter it, find their product, find their, their recipe, their meal. Page views went up by two and a half, 2.6 times, which meant that they were looking at almost seven pages per session. Now, since they can actually go into it and switch locations while they're in there, that means that they're looking at almost every location before they make their decision. That makes me feel really good because it's more likely they're going to surface the food that they're interested in and actually be happy about having lunch and dinner. And then the bounce rate went down by 64%. 23% is pretty good. They go in, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm assuming, they go in, they go to look at it, and then someone walks up and talks to them, and then they go and they walk off with their friends. So, I mean, there's bound to be some bounce rate, but this is, this is reasonable. So that concludes all of the pieces that came together, the project arc, the collaboration, the vision, the confidence growing. Um, this is some recommended reading that uh, sort of I go back to when I'm not sure about a particular subject or topic or I need to get a little deeper, like right now I'm working on the information architecture for our library and technology website. So that's everything from how do I connect to Wi-Fi to I need an ebook. Um, so I really had to dig into this information architecture, all 560 pages of it, to kind of brush up and be like, all right, this is really complicated. What do, how do we want to approach this? Um, so highly recommended. This is uh, modular design, atomic design with the Ethan Mark code. So. So I want to thank everyone here today. I have been so inspired and touched and felt so welcome. I want to move to Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> so are there any questions or clarification points that I could address? Or do we just all want to go to the bar? <laughs> yes, OK, and, and. <laughs> Two things. Uh, one, I'd love that you mentioned Jacob Nielsen, because mm -hmm. he's like a legend. And when you had your point up there to surface legend, I kind of thought you were going to talk about him. Um, <laughs> so that's the first. And the second is, um, in Montreal, or Quebec really, uh, and also for the most part the rest of Canada, a huge challenge in UX and UI is multilingual. Uh, it's like a mm -hmm. requisite. In fact, it's law, mm -hmm. um, depending on the site, obviously. So, I mean, that tends to really s throw sand in the gears. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't see that there was another language on the site. I'm just mm -hmm. wondering how that kind of thing, how you tackle that, because from my experience, it just, I mean, I don't want to say it gets in the way, but it's a, a real challenge basically at every level, and it ends up lengthening like basically every process. So a lot of the stuff that you find online, it's geared basically for one language and you have mm -hmm. to like retool everything. Mm -hmm. So like everything down to the metrics on the, you know, the display, you know, the, the fonts you use, the proportions, the iconography, no, mm -hmm. because obviously that's the whole, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. but it just tends to be um, so problematic and so time consuming. Mm -hmm. uh, just wonder if you have any, uh, feedback about that or, or advice? I think that's a really interesting point that you bring up and um, being as part of the Joomla community um, was something I became sensitive to a few years ago because most of Joomla is really thriving in the Netherlands and in Europe and so you know in order to become an administrator of Joomla and certified I had to actually learn how to build multilingual sites and, and go between the two. Um, as far as how that applies to user experience research, I mean, you're, you, you bring up some really good points. The fact that um, you have to think about typography size because you have an accent aigu versus, you know, uh, English language, which doesn't ever uh, include that, is something I actually had never thought of before. So I really appreciate you bringing that to my attention. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And then you also would have to do your scripts. Your, so we talked about moderated testing where you have, you know, moderated means you're in person, you're watching them use the screen, you have someone calculating clicks, someone taking the time. So if you have to do that in two languages, that's a tremendous um, increase in terms of investment. Now we do have unmoderated testing where you can create your script with something like user zoom, user testing, loop 11, and then 
translate that into two different task space. But even they don't make it simple where they say, okay, you've built all this, you've built this in test, now go ahead and you know, move it over into another language with the exact series of tasks and questions. I mean, that's a, that's a brilliant thing to recommend. And I've, I've been working with them a lot to, to sort of you know, get down to the, the pieces and parts that make up those software and give them recommendations and feedback on how to make that better. Um, so I will, I will bring that to the table. And I would be curious maybe over a cocktail, we could talk about this a little bit more because it's a fascinating topic. So are there any, I think there was one other question. Mm -hmm. Okay. One last question. Thank you so much. I sure. find it so inspiring to hear other people's use cases and learn about your experience. I'm wondering um, if you were to give yourself advice knowing what you know right now about this project when you were starting, mm. what are the, some, some things you would tell yourself? So advice, if I were coming to the project now with where I stand. I think that working with the computer science students, I would have really enjoyed bringing in more of them to the project. They would have benefited um, extremely from this experience. And there's so many that are willing to be a part of something like this. In fact, since then, they formed a UX group in Facebook that's private. And there's like 40 students in it in maybe a month uh, that have signed up. And there's only 100 computer science students total. Um, so I think involving more students in the process. Um, I think that if, if I could have started a little sooner when we had all of the stations open, because as I said, some are closed, so that created a strange lens through which we were um, operating, where we didn't have the full spectrum of all the features showing. So requiring a staging environment would have reduced a lot of effort on our part in having to redo things. So when someone says, no, I can't give you a staging environment on that, sort of saying, well, then you, no website, you know? Like, I, I really need you to provide that for me because having a place to play with your ideas, it, it gives you a certain level of freedom that, that I didn't get. And so I when we went live, it was just nail biting. And I don't think I want to go through that again. So. I'm afraid we don't have. Tiny little quick look at that face. <laughs> Real quick. <laughs> okay, it's super fast and whatever. Okay, so <laughs> um, basically it's more about like, uh, my question is kind of, um, it's about the uh, application of UX. Mm -hmm. So, and also the, I think the confusion between the relationship between UX and UI mm -hmm. and design in general. And I, I just wondering your thoughts on, uh, when is it appropriate to apply the cornucopia of, of uh, research that mm -hmm. you just laid out? Mm -hmm. And when is it inappropriate? Mm -hmm. And also, um, is it cool to skip UX and just go straight to UI? Is it cool to just do design? Do you know what I mean? Like I basically right. just, I'd like you to pick your brain on it. Well, I just want to talk for a minute, just not even a minute, 10 seconds, about assumptions, right? We have had so many amazing talks today about diversity and inclusion, right? Did anyone learn anything from that? Or did we all know it? Right? So if you get right to design and interaction design, then you've made assumptions about your users. And I think that's a really dangerous place to be. So I think including user experience research, even if it's just metrics and talking to a couple people because you have a small budget, right? Which is true. Like when I owned my company before I started this project, I didn't have that four month period always. And so I had to just kind of talk to two or three people and get as much as I could out of it, but it, it wasn't enough and that's why I went the next level. Um, so I definitely recommend UX in any project, even if it's just little snippets of bringing this in. Doing a persona doesn't take that much time, right? You find out a few people, you make up a template, you talk to your stakeholders about that. There's things you can do without the moderated testing. That was a huge investment of time and, and staff labor. So pick, and, pick up other pieces that you can and bring it in because that's going to expand you as a designer, an interaction designer, as well as interface designer, um, and, the, and the ideas that you have. So thank you, everyone, thank again. Thank you very much.